Welcome to this third lecture of the second week of this course on machine learning. This lecture will focus on features and relate issues related to features. As you may already have understood from the earlier lectures, feature engineering, that means the way to decide on uh, the, the appropriate uh, set of features to characterize objects within the data set is a crucial issue for machine learning. So the idea here is to try to characterize the concept learning task in terms of the relevant feature, uh, relevant features, feature vectors, and what one can call the object or feature space. So the classical way of viewing a scenario for a learning task is to define an appropriate set of features, view each data item in this data set as a feature vector. Consider the feature or object space spanned by the features. Populate the feature space with the feature vectors or data items. Find optimal multidimensional surfaces, hyperplanes in the object space that circumscribe the extensions of all the concepts involved. The engineering of features is crucial for the complexity of the object space and as a consequence also crucial for the complexity of the learning problem. We want to distinguish three basic cases for feature engineering. Case one. Uh, in case one, we have a reasonably well-composed set of features given based on domain theoretic considerations. In case two, we have a huge set of possible features available, but these features have to somehow be reduced to a manageable size that can ensure an efficient learning process. The third case is that we have data items that are of non-digital nature. It could be images, it can be sound, it could be other forms of representation. And in that case, the relevant features need to be extracted from the primary form of the data items as a separate process. Typically, this need to be done in a case-to-case -case fashion, depending on the nature of the primary form and the character of the application. So now we will discuss the first and third case shortly, and then more or less focus on the second case for the rest of this lecture. So now I'm going to discuss uh, an example to illustrate uh, the character of the first case. Uh, and this example um, is fetched from uh, the systematic example introduced uh, uh, in this week, the zoo data set. Um, so, the problem in this case is neither a volume problem due to a large ungraspable set of possible features, because we talk about a, a limited set of features, neither it is a representation problem caused by data items. Uh, in non-digital form, because uh, we assume that 
we can define the features and when we can have a digital values of those features. So then um, the question is, what are the problems here? So, so if you look at the two columns in this example, you can see the features that is the original features of, of the data set from the standard repository, fetched from the standard repository. In the second column, you can see a number of features that are inferred from a convention, the conventional zoological taxonomy used to uh, characterize or classify uh, animals. And uh, the, the, the set of features indicated in, in the second column uh, is derived uh, more or less exactly from the complex taxonomy uh, ranging from animal down to a specific kind of buffalo. Uh, so, as you may see, in a few cases, there is a correspondence. So, the same, uh, the, the same features occur. In other cases, you can see that uh, there are differences. Obviously, there is a reason for differences, because in the second column, the, the taxonomy is the taxonomy for a specific line uh, in the animal taxonomy, leading down to buffaloes and uh, related animals. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the optimal set of features related to, to that line is necessarily not optimal for all kinds of animal, like fish uh, and uh, reptiles and birds and so on. Um, but uh, it's not a trivial thing to say whether the, the left column is the optimal one for the problem at hand or something like the, uh, the right column may be more correct. So the bottom line here is for this kind of case where we have a reasonable amount of features uh, for a reasonably well-known domain, we still need a domain-based sanity check. Uh, of the features in such a case. It's also very important that we have a terminological consistency here, that we use the, the same term. We, we, it cannot be the case that we use one term, like in, in, in one of the columns here and another in the other, and um, make a misjudgment whether these are the same or different and so on. So, so the same characteristics need to be referred to in the same way in, in, in any proposal, competing proposal for, for the correct feature set. This is more like common sense. But also, it's very important that there is a clear feature definition uh, for every, every uh, candidate feature. So, for example, we have a Splendid example of that. I mean, in in the first column, in the, in the bottom, we have something like cat size, which is absolutely not self-evident what it means. Actually, looking at the data set, cat size means actually that uh, this kind of animal have the size of the cat or larger. So, so this is a boolean boolean feature that can the value one. If that kind of animal is considered being equal to or larger than a cat in size. But it's just an example that just by, by writing a symbol like cat size, it's not evident what it means. So, uh, uh, homework here uh, in, in any uh, feature engineering task is first of all, see to that the terminology is crystal clear, 
I don't always use the same term for, for the same kind of feature, and also that every feature is well defined. That's a starting point. There still, of course, be many other issues to consider, but I, at this point I just want to mention these few. So the third case is the case where the data items of our data set are of a heterogeneous and non-digital nature. And we need a separate pre-processing to go from the initial form and map that form into relevant digital features. And um, this can be done in, in several ways. So just look at the example here. There are four images. So either you can have a fully manual process where a person looks at each image and uh, infer a feature set for that image. So for the first, the, the inference is that we talk about birds. In the second image, it is of fishes. Uh, in the third, there are mammals. In the fourth, there are insects. And uh, one can go further, say there are so many uh, birds of a certain size, there are so many birds of another size. For the fishes, we can do the same. So, so we can do a manual anal analysis of each image and from that image uh, decide upon a description of that image in a digital form in terms of a number of manually produced features. The other extreme is that we have a totally automated process where a computer program, a computer vision enabled program manages these images and automatically infer the most likely set of important feature characterizing that image. And uh, that could be things in between. That could be such things and things are automated, but there uh, still need to be some human intervention in this process. Of course, in the end, we want a description of these images uh, in something equivalent to the uh, kind of feature setup we already looked at for, for the case number one. For sure, every non-digital form of representation demands its own analysis techniques here. We cannot believe that we can use the same techniques for any form. So, so for images, we need certain techniques, for sound, we need other techniques, and so on, uh, in, in order to enable some degree of automation for, for this kind of case. So now we turn to case two, dimensionality reduction or feature reduction. So in this case, we have a large set of possible features and we want to reduce them to a manageable uh, size. So uh, in most realistic cases, the amount of possibly available features which can be used to characterize data items is overwhelmingly large. In general, we want to reduce the number of considered features. The ground for removing a specific feature is that it may be either redundant or irrelevant. And if so, uh, can be removed without causing loss of information. The goal is, obtain, is to obtain an adequate set of informative, relevant and non-redundant features, still being able to describe the available data set. The underlying motivations for dimensionality reduction can be summarized as follows. At one, 
making models easier to interpret by humans. A smaller set of features is more easy to grasp for a human when, when looking at a model. Avoiding the curse of dimensionality, and we will come back to what that could mean. Third, reducing the risk of overfitting. Uh, and we will also go further into that. And finally, in general, shortening the computation times for learning processes. Naively, you can say that the more features we have to consider, the more costly uh, the computation will be. So the term curse of dimensionality refers to various phenomena that arise when analyzing and organizing data in high dimensional spaces. We talk about hundreds or thousands of dimensions. Problems that do not occur in low dimensional settings, such as the three dimensional physical space and others. The term was, was coined initially by Richard E. Bellman when he worked with problems in dynamic opt optimization. <clears throat> the common theme of the problematic phenomena is that when dimensionality increases, the volume of the space increases so fast that available data becomes sparse. This sparsity is problematic for any method that requires statistical significance, as the amount of data needed to support a result often grows exponentially with the dimensionality. Also, organizing and searching data often relies on detecting areas where objects form groups with similar properties. In high, however, in high dimensional cases, all objects appear to be sparse and dissimilar in many ways, which prevents efficient data organizations. So now we turn to what is termed overfitting versus underfitting. <coughs> this case is being two of the phenomena uh, most frequently affected by a wrong or inadequate selection of features. So overfitting is the production of a model that corresponds too closely or too exactly to a particular data set and may therefore fail to fit additional data or predict future observations reliably. Typically, an overfitted model is a model that contains more features than can be justified by the data set. And by the existence of all these features, um, the current set of data is um, too exactly fitted. In contrast, Underfitting occurs when a set of features cannot adequately capture the available data set. Typically, an underfitted model is a model where some features that would normally appear in a correctly specified model are missing. And as for overfitted, case, such a model will also tend to have a poor predictive performance. So in the example above, you can see two-dimensional examples, how it could look like. But as you understand, as for many other examples given, uh, the same can occur, phenomena can occur in, in multi-dimensional uh, ca cases. So finally, we turn to the two concepts of feature selection and feature attraction. The concept of feature selection is pretty straightforward by being the process of selecting a subset of relevant features from the original set and discarding the rest. The three main criteria for selection of a feature are one, how informative is the feature? The second, how relevant is the feature? 
And thirdly, is the feature non-redundant? Actually, rele relevance and redundancy are could be thought of as equivalent, but not so, because it may be so that two relevant features are so similar or overlapping that one can consider one of them as redundant. I mean, in general, what we want to achieve is to have as few features as possible as long as we can discriminate in a good way uh, among all uh, data items in the data set and the categories in question. So feature extraction is a little more complex. It's rather the process of, it's not the process of selecting anything or throwing something away. It's rather the process of deriving new features. Could either be as a simple combination of the original ones, or it could be as a more complex mapping from the original set to a new set. When we started to talk here about always reducing uh, the number of features, but actually it could be so that without really reducing the number, one could create a set of more suitable features that simplifies the learning task. Um, so feature extraction is, is in that way kind of more, more, more general. Uh, because it captures uh, all kinds of mappings from one old original set of features to a new one, given, of course, uh, that that the new set is, is is more useful for the learning task. So in both cases, the learning task is supposed to be more tractable in the resulting feature space than in the original. Independently, if you use a selection procedure or you use some extraction process. So, this is the end of this lecture. I want to summarize uh, by saying that I hope now you understood that feature engineering is a key ingredient in the area of machine learning. And that all the cases mentioned in this lecture are relevant. Both the case where you have non-digital data items that have to be transformed into some uh, digital form uh, with a discrete set of features. Also the case where you already have a reasonable number of features, but where they have to be uh, judged in terms of domain relevance uh, and in the light of a domain theory. And thirdly, when you have a huge set uh, of, of um, discrete features that have to be reused uh, in order to be more optimal for the performance of the learning algorithm. So uh, by this, I want to thank you for your attention. The next lecture uh, will be on uh, the topic of scenarios for concept learning. So thanks and goodbye.